Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second session of the Museums for the 21st Century webinar series. I am Megan Hewitt, Executive Director of the American Institute for Indonesian Studies, and I'm joined by uh, our partners from the Museum 21 project in Indonesia, Institute Konservasi and Museum Surya in US-based partners, Tracing Patterns Foundation, and the Smithsonian Institution for Asian Cultural History Program. Museums for the 21st Century, uh, known by the shorthand M21, brings together curators and scholars from the US and Indonesia who specialize in the future direction of museums in three areas, collection is exhibition and research, engagement with family and youth, and art conservation. The project began in December 2022 as a professional development program consisting of in-person workshops in three Indonesian institutions, including Museum Textil Jakarta, Museum Provinsi Kalimantan Barat in, Pontia in Pontianak, and Museum Balanga in Provinsi Kalimantan Tengah. This webinar series is designed to disseminate results from the in-person course modules conducted in December of last year, as well as to address challenges faced by Indonesian museums working to disseminate information for wider public audiences. The M21 program is made possible through generous funding support by the US Embassy in Jakarta. This second session of the M21 webinar series is focused on the subject of conservation. Today, we will discuss growing trends in conservation practice such as collaborative conservation, as well as the link between conservation and community. We will also explore pertinent challenges in conserving organic materials in hot and humid environments, much like Indonesia. Before I introduce our speakers for today, please allow me to make a few announcements about the structure and logistics of our session. Uh, first of all, we're pleased to offer simultaneous translation from English into Indonesian language for our Zoom audience. This is provided today by our very talented interpreter and moderator, Saiful Bakri. Terima kasih, Saiful. The structure of the session will consist of a 45 minute presentation by our guest speaker, a five minute response from our moderators, and then the Q&A session will open for the audience. You are welcome to input your questions in the chat at any time in either English or Indonesian language. We will also take questions from the YouTube live stream for those watching there. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panelists for this session. If I can please invite Ellen, Seifel, and Crystal to join me on the screen. Welcome Seifel, welcome Ellen, welcome Crystal. Our moderators for today's session are Seifel Bakri and Kristen Hale. Saiful Bakri is founding member of Institute Conservasi, an organization aimed to improve and provide conservation advocacy, education, training, research, and services of art and cultural materials in Indonesia. He is also a graduate student in the UCLA Conservation of Material Cultures PhD program. Through this program, he seeks to address the cultural importance and physical production of traditional materials for conservation treatment to better meet the environmental, social, and cultural needs of non-Western communities, as well as to explore how these practices can be incorporated into Western practices. Previously, he worked for three years at the Bali Cultural Heritage Preservation Office in Gyanyar, Bali, a technical unit responsible for the conservation of cultural heritage in three provinces of Bali. Um, West, East, and Nusa Tenggara. I'm sorry, in three provinces of Indonesia. He holds a Master of Cultural Materials Conservation from the University of Melbourne and a Bachelor of Humanities and Archaeology from Universitas Indonesia. Saiful, as I mentioned previously, will also be providing simultaneous translation into Indonesian language for us today. Our next moderator is Kristen Hale. Uh, she has worked as a textile conservator and independent researcher for the last 20 years. She recently completed a two-year Andrew W. Mellon Conservation Fellowship at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. 
She holds an MA in art conservation with a textile specialization from the Bern University of Applied Sciences in collaboration with the Abbe Stiftung Switzerland. In addition, Crystal holds a BA in art conservation and another BA in art history and textile design. She has completed programs in weaving analysis at Centre International d'Etudes des Textiles Anciennes in Lyon, France, embroidery at the Royal School of Needlework in Hampton Court Palace, London, and has taught courses in bobbin lace at the Lace Museum in Sunnyvale, California. She is also a board member of the Ethnic Arts Council in Los Angeles and an in-house conservator with Tracing Patterns Foundation in Berkeley, California. At, uh, Crystal is actively engaged in heritage preservation and contemporary museum practices in collaboration with all of our partners for this session. Last but certainly not least, our guest speaker today is Ellen Pearlson. Ellen, welcome today. Um, we're very pleased to have you. Ellen was the senior object conservator at the Brooklyn Museum in New York where she also served as an advisor on the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. She is a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, in the UCLA Getty Program in the Conservation of Cultural Heritage, UCLA, UCLA Cultural Materials Conservation, and UCLA's Department of Information Studies. As a member of the founding conservation faculty in 2005, she began designing and teaching graduate classes in the conservation of organic materials, the ethics of working with indigenous communities, preventative conservation and managing collections. Her publications include conservations of feather work from Central and South America. And she is currently completing a book entitled Getty Readings and Conservation, Conservation and Stewardship of Indigenous Collections, Changes and Transformations. Ellen is also a fellow in the American Institute for Conservation and the International Institute for Conservation. She is a 2022 recipient of an American Academy in Rome Fellowship, winner of the Keck Award and president of the Association of North American Graduate Programs in Conservation. Today, Ellen will be speaking with us about the conservation of plant and animal materials in tropical environments where excess moisture and heat, along with insects and mold, pose particular risk to conservation practices. In this talk, Ellen will identify the chemistry and unique sensitivities of both plant and animal sourced materials, focusing on cultural examples from Indonesia to further examine both damage and mitigation methods. Ellen, we are so pleased to have you join us today. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite you to share your preservation, your uh, presentation on conservation with us today. Thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you so very much for that um, really auspicious introduction. And I'm extremely grateful to Megan and Saifal and Sandra and Crystal for inviting me to be with you today. Um, and my topic has already been described, so I'm gonna take it right off now. <laughs> um, so let me just advance here, okay. So I, I wanna be sure that everybody who is um, with us today understands what I mean when I talk about um, plant and animal source materials. It's really interesting. We often don't think that much about um, the origin of the very materials that we're caring for and that we value. But in fact, there are particular sensitivities that are um, exhibited by materials that have found their original sources within growing plants. And for that, I would refer to here going clockwise, for example, basketry um, and other materials made from plant bamboo leaf and bamboo stem, which I know is, these are all um, Indonesian examples that I have for you here. And then of course, cotton textiles, 
textile, which are on a cotton support, and that's the foundational material um, within that textile. Um, the wood that is used to carve masks that are can be highly decorated, such as you see here. Um, I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Um, and um, as well as, oh, um, as well as uh, this wooden and um, uh, uh, and metal spinning wheel. So these are just some examples of plant sourced cultural materials. If we refer again to animal sourced materials, we're looking here at, for example, um, going clockwise again. Um, uh, leather, leather, such as in the case of this shadow puppet, highly decorated shadow puppet. Um, moving again clockwise, we are looking here at a very elaborately carved and jewel encrusted ivory handle for a kris or sword. Um, moving down below, you can see these, this elab these elaborate feathers that are used to decorate these headdresses at the bottom right. And then again, just moving over as, as a reminder that we're also including buffalo horn. Buffalo horn is also an animal sourced material with particular properties. And this is an, 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 a buffalo horn um, handle on this knife. And this may even be, um, a buffalo horn, um, uh, what's that called again? <laughs> that you put your knife into. So there we are. Um, but just to distinguish those materials. Moving forward, I wanted to, I'm gonna begin by talking about plant materials. And just to say that there are these large chemicals or polymers, like really long um, chemicals that are the predominant um, components of plant sourced materials. And those chemicals are cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin. And there's a good reason why we care about these, these chemical components because they behave differently um, in response to all of the physical agents that we need to worry about. So this is what cellulose looks like. And this is what hemicellulose looks like. And this is what lignin looks like. And I'm sharing these not to confound you with these particular chemicals, but just to show you that you can have, for example, in, this, in the image marked cellulose fibrils, you can have a textile, for example, made out of a plant material. And if you drill all the way down and you look at what is the composition of that, of that textile, you'll get to these cellulose fibrils, which will get down to microfibrils, which will end up being these long cellulose um, polymers, as we say. And hemicellulose is a slightly more disorganized um, version of cellulose, and hence that's why it's called hemicellulose. And lignin is an even more complicated, lignin is here on the right. It's an even more complicated um, material that's found large, most largely in woody materials. So just keep that in mind. But when we're talking about these particular materials, we, we have to recognize that in fact, they, they respond differently to um, different agents of the environment that you are all in Indonesia, in Jakarta are, um, are exposed to. So what do high, how does high levels of moisture respond to cellulose? Well, it swells and shrinks, um, high, level, high levels of moisture swell and shrink cellulose fibrils, and it can dissolve hemicellulose. So for example, this is a, a map on paper 
paper is largely cellulose, depending upon the source for the paper. And you can see here the extremes of moisture creating problems for this map on paper. So all of that extreme cockling that you see is a consequence of extreme levels of moisture. Where we might see, for example, a dissolution of the hemicellulose is an example like this basket, where this is a basket that's <clears throat> made out of plant leaves that have been harvested and you know plant leaves and stems and it assembled into a beautiful basket. And yes, there is soiling imaged on the interior of this basket, but excess moisture has not only moved the soiling away from the bottom of the base of the basket, but that dark ring that you see around the, um, around the basket base is actually a consequence of dissolved components of those cellulose and hemicellulose depositing as a tie line in that basket. We can some we actually sometimes see complete dissolution of plant-based material when there's been a very, very high level of moisture introduced. What else do we think about when we're thinking about these particular materials? Well, one of the things that will happen with high acidic exposure is that um, the exposure to extreme acids will also cause important modifications that result in damage to these, these um, particular chemicals. So just to, again, give you some examples. So I, I pointed out here already embrittling and yellowing as two of the problems um, that can come from exposure to acids. So this is a, a diagram on paper. This diagram on paper is exhibiting classic acid damage. This was a diagram that was folded up. And you'll notice, if you will, with me, that all of these exposed edges, imagine this folded up into a kind of a rectangle, and the exposed outer edges were the ones that were um, exposed to a high acid environment. And as a consequence of that, you see this yellowing, but also embrittlement. And this will progress to uh, tears. And also, you know, because it'll continue to weaken in those, in those regions. This is another example, which is actually quite a shocking one. Believe it or not, this comb is also finds its source in plant material. This is a plastic called cellulose acetate. And now you all kind of have gotten what cellulose is. Okay, so this comb started off as being made from cotton fibers. The cotton fibers were treated and processed in such a way that it converted into this plastic called cellulose acetate. Cellulose acetate can both give off acid but it also, that very acid that it gives off, attacks it itself. And so this kind of breakdown into fine particles and powdering is exactly what we expect when we have items made out of both cellulose acetate and cellulose nitrate, both of which are plant-based um, uh, materials. What else can happen? What else is a source of damage? Well, excess light is another source of damage on cellulose and hemicellulose. It will cause fading of those materials and it will darken lignin, which is interesting. So you have these two different reactions happening depending upon the composition of the material you're working with. So here, for example, is a group of newspapers or, or papers, and some of these have faded upon exposure to light, and some of them that have included more lignin have actually darkened. 
And I'm not even talking here about the reaction of the, the printing inks that are on here or the dyes that are used in textiles, um, you know, or the colorants that are applied to drawings. I'm talking about the very source material itself and damage that can occur um, due to uh, due to light, excess light and ultraviolet energy. So this is a piece of wood, just to illustrate this point more graphically, this is a piece of wood that has been protected from sunlight on the bottom and exposed to sunlight on the top. And you can see this kind of consequential darkening because this is an item that contains a lot of light now. What else do we know about these plant materials? Well, we know that insects love them. So here is something that I'm gonna just tell you, and I think it'll probably be very graphically clear. Um, cellulose is largely made up of sugars. It's made up of glucose or sugar um, molecules that all join together to form the cellulose molecule. And so, and hemicellulose also includes some of these sugars. Lignin, not so much. Actually, lignin protects a lot of materials from insects, but we, we are, as soon as we're dealing with natural plant sourced materials or plant modified materials, like the plastic I showed you just now, we're working with, materials that are attractive to insects. And especially, especially in combination with high heat and high humidity. Taken all together, the tropical climate is one that is extremely conducive to, um, to harboring insects on um, plant-based plant materials. So this is a range of illustrations. Um, the, the top left is showing you a book, the pages of which are cellulosic and they're, um, they've been channeled through by um, a particular kind of boring beetle that lo loves plant materials. Um, the lower left is a, um, a cotton textile from Borneo. And this also is showing you signs of insect debris that have been kind of cradled or held inside a fold. So far, we don't see extensive damage, but we know this has formed the shelter, a space of shelter um, for insects. The center image is a plant, a plant leaf. Actually, I believe it's actually um, bamboo, and this may be bamboo leaf or stem. Um, and I believe it's actually stem basket. And you can see too that it's harboring insect um, with a lot of surrounding by a lot of webbing and um, some insect, some larva casings. On the far right, we have an interesting situation of the detail of a piece of furniture. This is a furniture leg that had an attached molding. And what's uncertain here until further examination is whether the insects were more attracted to a, an adhesive that was used to attach that molding, which sometimes can happen. And then we see a sort of a, 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 you know, something that can result in detachment, but it's a more superficial kind of damage or whether we're seeing a kind of wood used for that molding, which is on the far right, the curved element, where we're actually getting deeper insect damage preferentially into that molding um, because of the kind of wood that it's, that it's made from. Rodents are also um, uh, detrimental to plant materials. They thrive on plant materials. They thrive on the cellulosic materials that, that these collections can provide. This is a collection that I work with. Um, the materials originate from Borneo and they're now in the United States, in the Northeastern United States. But what you can see here on the left, you can see all of these rodent droppings 
that are, um, you know, very commonly found in the storage depot maintained for this collection. And on the right, you see where we're really starting to see problems because the rodents have, have used bits of the baskets themselves, as well as feathers from other items and um, storage materials, store, you know, storage housing materials to build a nest inside of a basket. So on the right, you're looking at a rodent nest inside a basket. So plant materials will also, because again, because of this sugary um, uh, constituent, they're also very, very good at harboring mold. They are nutritive, they're nutri it's nutritive to insects, it's nutritive to, um, to mold. And um, this next slide is just also showing you um, the, the speed with which mold, well, it doesn't show you the speed, but I can tell you the speed with which mold can propagate on, for example, uh, this um, plated basket on the far left and the plated, the detail of another plated basket in the center. And you can see these are both um, made from, you know, leaf, leaf um, elements. And these leaf elements are extremely attractive to harboring mold growth under a high humidity condition. On the far right, you also see, you know, again, a cardboard box. Cardboard is also made from cellulose. So it too is not immune to um, providing nut a nutritive environment for, for mold. And the, all of the papers, which are important records associated with the collections, um, they too um, were, you know, are very subject to very intensive mold growth. So I'm sorry, this is like, before I get to some good news, I will, and sorry for all of that bad news, I'm gonna now turn to animal materials and also just kind of help you understand that animal materials are in some ways even more complex because they all are based on proteins where we had the plant materials that were based on primarily cellulose. We now have animal, animal materials that are also based on very long polymeric materials, but they're based on proteins as well as oils and fats. And the primary protein structure that you see on the left is actually a sequence of a chain of amino acids. And the amino acids are what can actually differentiate one protein from another. So it's that sequence and the selection of amino acids that are kind of part and parcel of a certain species that actually constitute the individuality of that species and their products that we use. And then on the right, you see the, the structure of a fat or an oil. Fats and oils are closely related. And actually a lot of natural waxes are also very closely related like beeswax um, and other kinds of vegetable nut waxes, nut fats, are closely related. And you can see here that there are three fatty acids, these long chains and a glycerol backbone. And if you've ever heard the term triglyceride, which I'm imagining most of you have, you'll see the tri means three and that's three fatty acids and glycer glyceride refers to that backbone. So just, that's just a, a quick, um, quick dive into proteins. There are many, as people involved in caring for cultural heritage, we have to be aware of three different kinds of protein, even though the cellulose is, there's only like one kind, you know, um, with different constituents, but with animal proteins, we can be looking at keratin. Keratin is what is found in 
hair. It's what is found in wool. It's what is found in horn. It is what is found in feather. It's what is found in our uh, fingernails. So that is all keratin, our hair, our fingernails. And keratin, again, is this very complex um, material. Um, I'll again use my cursor and hope you can see it. This is a single hair. It has a scale pattern. It has the cuticle. It has all of these micro fibrils in it. And as those get small within the microfibrils or even smaller fibrils, things just get smaller and smaller and smaller until you're finally at the keratin, which is shaped like this. And that's referred to as a helix. And that's just what the molecule looks like if you happen to be looking at it. And then if we look at what collagen looks like, so collagen is what's in our skin covered by hair, which is keratin, and it's in every skin of every animal we value and use um, to produce cultural heritage. And it's a little bit different from, it's obviously it has different amino acids, you know, or a different arrangement of amino acids because that's how proteins differentiate, but also not, to, it doesn't simply have a single helix it's got a triple helix. It's really complex. Um, just leave it at that to say it's really complex. And then finally, we have a very a much smaller category, which is unique to silk. And that is sericin and fibroin. It, it also looks incredibly long, you know, really, really long. It has amino acids, same thing. And um, it has this what's called a beta sheet configuration. And, and when you look at a silk fiber, the sericin is in the surrounding region and the fibroin is in the middle. And these three proteins really define the properties of so many materials we care about. And I'll just say, just illustrate that here. Again, to tell you like, what is keratin again? Keratin is in the feathers, it's in the horn, you know, it's in all of these materials that we really value. Um, and what is collagen? Collagen is in every animal skin harvested, processed material that we use. There is also some collagen in bone and there's some collagen in ivory. So that should be taken on board too. And then of course, sericin has a narrower, um, we find it in a narrower range of materials and that is silk textiles. But what do we know about the sensitivities of, of the protein, of these materials that are protein based? And let's move into that. So animal proteins have very specific sensitivities and you know as i said okay i already mentioned you know moisture extremes of moisture are problematic for cellulose materials and they're problematic for the paper the cotton the you know the, all of the the wood materials that we work with but actually in combination with heat um high levels of moisture cause irreversible damage to leather. And by that, I want to point out that like we as conservators have no means for dealing with leather that has been very seriously affected like these shoes on the right hand side. These shoes have been subjected to such a high level of heat and moisture that the collagen in the skin has chemically altered into a different form altogether. And we are unable to do anything about that. The puppets, the two sh wonderful shadow puppets you see on the left, that kind of deformation is also probably untreatable. And so, um, we, there's a really, there are some really strong reasons to avoid 
these high levels of moisture and heat um, because we can go back in and further relax the cellulose-based materials and we may be able to recover their original form and shape, but we have fewer options with these protein-based materials. So animal proteins are also subject to, um, to, ex to mold growth, right? Through excessive moisture and heat. Um, and why is that? So they're not, they're not the sugary substrate that um, those, those plant sourced materials are, but you know what? We often have other kinds of coatings that we have traditionally either found or have applied to a lot of these animal materials. So for example, the books that you see on the left, there has been some kind of fatty material, an oil or a wax applied to that, those book bindings, those book covers. And as a consequence, that is what is harboring the mold growth. And in the feathers on the right, a lot of birds, particularly water birds, you know, marine, marine birds, they have a very high fatty layer that they apply to their feathers. Think ducks, think of ducks. If you've ever like gotten a duck and actually dealt with it as a full bird, you'll know that those are very oily feathers, very, and seagulls and other kinds of water-borne birds. And so th there is a whole category of feathers that are particularly attractive to mold growth. And this brings me also to this notion of applying waxes to say wooden sculptures as a way to protect them from insect growth or insect attack, you can sometimes unknowingly by applying waxes to these materials, be applying something that could be particularly attractive to mold growth. And so that's a kind of a note of caution about that practice. Um, insects and rodents are major predators as well for protein materials. They, are, they typically are different insects than would attack plant sourced materials. However, what we know very well about insect populations or insects are the best survivors. They are true, true survivors and they change their diet depending upon what's available for them. So that's just a really important thing to know, I think as well. Um, but what you see here in this slide are images of on the left, you see, you know, um, these are typically moths, um, case making moths and webbing clothes moths, that two closely related moth species that will absolutely attack feathers as their favorite, favorite material choice. They will also attack fur and hair when it's available to them. In the center of this slide, you see an image of a leather item that has gotten, clearly has gotten, been exposed to moisture. So this is again, the other thing, if I haven't already said this, um, ex, you know, um, excessive moisture um, and heat, excessive temperature and moisture um, of creates the ideal environment for insects as well as mold. Um, insects propagate more quickly, more rapidly in warmer climates. So they go through more egg laying, more adult production, more larva, the eating stage. They, they increase that cycle dramatically. And um, 
and, and moisture is also something that's very conducive to a lot of insect activity. So in the center, the leather um, item that you see was clearly exposed to excessive moisture because of the fine shrinkage pattern we see on the surface, but also that top surface has been grazed off by insects um, that are protein loving insects, as you can see. And on the far right, I'm showing you two very different things that um, on the top right, you see actually a section of an ivory ornament that, that a rodent has used or rodents have used mice, rats, squirrels have used to brush their teeth, to basically sharpen and polish and clean their teeth. And we see this kind of evidence and it will often look like this irregular kind of um, gnawing edge that you can kind of see here, this jagged edge and jagged surface where they keep approaching an edge to an available edge um, to you know, work their teeth against. The horn example on the lower right was initially thought to perhaps have been attacked by mice, but in fact, it is a horn, um, a, you know, a horn um, playing instrument that was attacked by beetles. Um, so we have to we have to really keep in mind that these proteinaceous materials, even if they seem very tough to us, they are they are very attractive to insects. And I know that it's probably, um, as I mentioned earlier, I know that many of you are very aware already of the fact that light is damaging to the colorants that are applied to, you know, plant materials. So for example, we know that, you know, the, that the, the colorants applied to wooden masks and the colorants applied to drawings and paintings, and certainly the colorants applied to textiles of all composition, that that, that is light, excess light is extremely damaging to those colorants, but it's actually also damaging to the substrate itself, to the very material those colorants are part of, excuse me. So on the left, you see you know, a book binding, a beautifully tooled book binding. And it was originally that brilliant orange color, brilliant orange brown color. And um, you can see all of the fading that occurred on the spine and the upper section of the book covers where it had been exposed to light. Um, and, and as I said, you know, we, we see that this was the original color um, and this, this change may only be due to chemically changing the, the, that dye stuff, but, it may, but we know experimentally that it will also attack the collagen that is the substrate. In the case of feathers, just to remind you, the feathers are keratin, and these are undyed feathers that are from a scarlet ibis bird that's indigenous to, um, to Brazil and um, lower parts of Florida, the Eastern shores of Brazil and Florida in the United States and maybe elsewhere in the world. And this is the natural, the lower section, you're seeing the natural color of this bird. And I did a controlled light aging study where I covered up from here on down the lower section to protect this, these sections from fading and could see how rapidly the upper sections would fade and lose intensity of color. But then prolonged lighting exposure would also begin to attack the keratin protein. In the upper right, you see a bedspread that is partially made out of silk. So the, the central section is, um, I'm just gonna move myself so I can, I'm not blocking um, where I wanna be looking. Um, the central section is, is, not, is not made of silk, 
but this entire border of this bedspread was made from silk. And it almost looks like it was intended as a fringe, but it is not. It was light damaged to the point where the silk absolutely shattered and um, you know, broke apart into these discrete sections. And finally, this is a wool garment in the lower right. And this wool garment, of course, you know, it did have a blue dye, a few, you know, a blue dye that was fugitive to light. And we see that the blue is only pertain is only there where it was protected, where these flaps were closed. And this entire costume, military costume, was supposed to appear blue. But again, we also know experimentally that the that the keratin that comprises the wool of the fabric is also susceptible to damage um, by excessive light and ultraviolet energy. So what am I going to recommend? There are a few things I'm going to recommend. I am, as Seifel can tell you, I'm a great believer in knowing what your climate is, how your climate is performing. And this is a case I'm starting off initially with excessive temperature and moisture. And I, I was very um, happy to see that there is a company called Data Logger Indonesia. And I show you here a page from their website. And they have these devices, which are um, little, little um, data loggers. You can see, get a sense of their size. And they are, you use a very simple technology where you can, with a smartphone, you can actually download a free app and you can program these loggers to record the temperature and relative humidity. Now you're not correcting the temperature and the relative humidity when you acquire this information, but what you are doing is you're empowering yourself by giving yourself information that might help you identify where in your facility you have a, a, an environment that is beneficial to plant and animal materials and where you have an environment that's deleterious or dangerous for those collections. So I'm, I'm giving you here an example of you know a floor plan of a complex museum and I and I recognize that I recognize you you may have nothing more elaborate than a, a few rooms or one room in which you're keeping collections however if you are able to compare across the, um, the spaces available to you. If you're able to compare across those spaces, where are the coolest and driest locations? So I'm, I'm essentially making this up. You know, let's say we were comparing with those data loggers, five of these locations. We would have spent about, a thousand dollars US, which which again may not be possible, but I'd be interested to hear. But maybe after we invested that, we would find out that we have two spaces in our larger space that are the most cool, naturally coolest, and are the most naturally driest. And that would be where I would advocate placing your plant and animal sourced materials that we just talked about. Of course, if you're building from scratch, there's a whole other array of tools and methods you can use, you know, build a collection with a reflective or green roof. I mean, that's a whole talk in and of itself, but this is kind of one of the reasons why I feel like it's really important to 
give yourself the information that allows you to make the absolute strongest decisions. Another step that can be made when you're in a humid environment, and especially an environment that has extensive um, exposure, potential exposure to sunlight and light, is to store materials in sealed plastic trunks with silica gel. And silica gel, which I've picked, shown you here in the little on the right hand side of the screen, are the desiccants that are available when you purchase electronics and they are shipped to you or when you purchase new sneakers and you buy them in their box, you know, they come with these desiccant packets that are designed to dry out the air irrespective of the temperature. And these plastic trunks are available in most home supply stores and they are doing many things at once. You know, they can be, they can be creating little local climates in storage that with silica gel added can dry out the environment and they're providing darkness. Another thing that can be done very affordably is to implement an integrated pest management program. And I'm showing you now an image from this collection that I talked about that's in the Northeast United States in a very cold and humid environment and in a very permeable building that is absolutely open to insects and rodents. And we are triaging, helping ameliorate that situation. So you want the reason for using these insect traps that I'm illustrating here is these are extremely affordable cardboard traps. They come flat with a, a, a separating layer over the sticky part where the in, you see the insects on this slide in the center. You, when they're flat, you can label the outside and you can place them, you can label the location and the date and you can place them throughout your space. And then you fold them, you take the, the, take the um, sealant off the sticky section, you fold them up and you can put them all over your environment. What do you learn from this? You learn what kind of insects do I have and where are they coming in? You learn that really pretty quickly and so like, for example, we were really happy. We looked at this trap that you see imaged here and we said, thank goodness, these are not insects that eat our collections. And that was a really good thing because we found that out. We weren't happy they were getting in, but we were really happy that they weren't the kinds of insects that eat our plant and animal sourced materials. They could be creating other problems, but that was not one of them. And then what else can you do if you have infested materials? So obviously, if you have access to a good stable power source and you are able to freeze collections, freezing is a really effective tool for pest eradication. It you, I always encourage that you photograph an item before you put it through um, a freezing process. And then you follow a procedure where you put the item into two plastic bags, one within the next. And then it has to go in a low temperature freezer, minus 20 degrees Celsius for a two week period. And we've established that temperature and time because it kills all the life stages of the insect. It kills them whether they're just still in the eggs, ready to hatch. It kills them whether they're in the larva stage. It kills them whether they're adults, et cetera. And one, if you are able to follow this protocol 
when things are taken out of the freezer, they should be thoroughly vacuumed because if you leave the insect, the dead insect debris inside the textile, that's attractive too. You've just put more protein inside your, inside your item and that's very attractive to new insects coming in. They really like their own debris. If you don't have access to a freezer or to an anoxic, um, an anoxic protocol, I have put into my references that follow my discussion, some very, very in interesting links that actually will show you how you can enclose collections in black plastic bags, place them in a high solar area, an area that gets very strong sunlight, and you can use heat to kill insects. And so that's a very low cost way for any size object that can be bagged up in plastic, black plastic bags, or you can cut the plastic bag open, wrap it around, tape it to the next plastic bag and assemble a, a mechanism for doing this kind of pest eradication. I really do not encourage the application of kerosene or gasoline or liquid pesticides onto collections because there are typically unwanted side effects like the painted decoration might, might bleed or run, the dye stuffs in textiles might run. You may have very unwanted um, outcomes of applying chemicals. And increasingly we are trying very hard to bypass chemical methodologies. So let me just continue so I make sure not to take up more than my allotted time. So also for integrated pest management, once you've used those traps and you've identified, this is again, the collection I've been working on. Um, once you've identified where your rodents are getting in and where your insects are getting in, um, through those, through that trapping or the other evidence they leave, as you see in these images, you can seal up your building. You can use steel wool. You can you you can shove steel wool into every little crevice, and you can apply broad tape like duct tape across all of the gaps to try to exclude insects and rodents. I would also try to avoid overcrowding storage. This is our storage space that we have been working with and we've taken great efforts to, as you see on the left, raise up all of this significant collection material off the floor so that nothing is on the floor because in case of a water event, we would get our valued collections would get extremely wet and you know would distort as we talked about and then we also this is the intervention on the right are these metal um, shelving that you metal wire shelving that we purchased from a home supply store and assembled ourselves and we're using them to try to alleviate crowding and storage we also try to vacuum frequently if we are vacuuming frequently with a HEPA vacuum or, or a triple filtered vacuum, we can also, um, we make insects very un, feel very unwelcome. We make rodents feel very unwelcome when we do those things. Um, finally, or not finally, almost finally, when we're talking about light, so, if you've already figured out where your temperature and humidity is most um, extreme and, and not sympathetic to these particular materials we're talking about, you also don't want to be putting these materials in full sunlight. We, you know, 
we windowed spaces are extremely people friendly spaces. I mean, we all gravitate toward, you know, um, having our cappuccino or a cup of tea in, you know, in a sunlit space, but we're trying to keep our collections not in that space. You know, we're trying to have window shades. And I want to refer again to those plastic containers that can do a lot of good work, um, even if you have uncontrolled light in your storage um, you know, facilities. And in exhibition spaces, then we have to make sure that we're putting near our sunlit areas the materials I didn't talk about today. So for example, ceramics, metals, stone, those are materials that are not plant and animal sourced and they will not mind the sunlight. Um, so, you know, it's just making those kinds of smart decisions. You can measure and monitor light. It's a costly undertaking. Um, I, you know, on the left is a monitor, it's the Cadillac of monitors. It's a $2,000 piece of equipment. It measures temperature, relative humidity, visible light and ultraviolet. On the right is a much more simple light meter that's $200 and that's, that's equally or, or as important if it's possible to do that. But even if you're unable to do it, you can, sorry, you can still know visually where the hot spots and bright spots are in your space. And you can still make sure you're privileging your plant and animal source materials and keeping them out of that, um, those locations. Um, I did wanna finally say that you also wanna avoid acid damage, pollutant damage, because this is deleterious to plant and animal materials. And, but I would say, especially things that derived from plants. So paper and wood and, you know, cotton fabrics, et cetera. So what is, you know, plant source materials like wood also actually give off acids. So you see here, you know, on the left, you see a Picasso print that had been over matted with a, a wood pulp mat board, a low quality mat board. And that's why you see that the paper itself is completely darkened all around the perimeter. It's not dyes, it's not colorants, it's the paper. The paper is now stained all the way. Here we have a linen textile lining of a garment that was on an acidic hanger. It's the linen that is um, absolutely darkened, embrittled, and this will start to lead to further breakdown of this textile. And here we have the example of wood, one of our plant source materials giving off acid. And we don't, this is not an ideal storage trunk. This is again in the collection that I'm working with. Um, a lot of the collections, cotton and other collections, textiles, et cetera, are stored in these wooden trunks. And we're trying to put acid-free materials as a barrier and, and then as we can transfer them to those plastic bins that are much more benign for these materials. So, I will just say by conclusion that extremes in temperature, moisture, and excess light and local pollutants such as acids present high risks to plant and animal materials and especially in a tropical climate because, because these are, you know, um, I understand they're, they're more pronounced and more difficult to control. And that measuring and monitoring at, at least at minimum temperature and relative humidity can allow you to make sound decisions for your space in re reorganizing things in your space. And that even without a light measurement program, 
you can prevent light, excessive light on sensitive materials. And that's an important step to take. I already talked about how the use of these very affordable insect traps can allow you to start doing a um, monitoring program that will allow you to seal up your building and understand who the pest culprits are that you're dealing with. And again, avoiding acidic enclosures, particularly important for plant materials. And as I mentioned, and I will just, I will share this of course with you. These are further web-based resources. First on the environment, on temperature and relative humidity. Then on lighting, these are things that I really think are just great. And then finally, a whole slew of insect um, resources, including the one on solar bagging that I mentioned to you, which I think is really important. Also some resources on identifying pests and Insect Limited is the source of the um, sticky traps that we use. And again, other low temperature, uh, a low temperature as well as a um, solar uh, resource. And I, I do want to fully acknowledge all of the resources I drew upon in giving this talk. And it's a huge number. So um, I will share these with you too. Sources for plant chemistry and images in case you want to go back to them yourselves and get learn more, excuse me, and then sources for animal chemistry and images. And with that, I would like to say thank you and open this up um, to uh, what, whatever my, my uh, hosts would like to do next. So I will, I will stop sharing. Crystal, shall, should I stop sharing then? Yes, thank you so much, Ellen. This has been fabulous. I'm just going to jump in and say, I mean, how much I appreciate your talk. Um, I, even though I'm a conservator of many years, I feel like I learned so many new things or re was reminded of so many new things today. And I think you just have so many fabulous suggestions for humid climates and hot environments, which are really tricky to work in. And I think a lot of individuals in this meeting have, uh, you know, suffered through insect infestations and any number of problems with their collections. Um, I just wanted to actually jump in and ask you, um, I know that there's been a lot of concern about treatments of collections, um, particularly with um, paraffin. And um, we've had another question about the treatment of ironwood with paraffin wax as a way of treating insect infestation or avoiding it. Um, and I'm wondering if you could, because your suggestion about solar bagging is so interesting, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit, I realize there's going to be plenty for people to read, but elaborate a little bit on how that might work with wooden objects or larger objects that people might have concerns about. So it actually is incredibly effective and it, um, it, you know, the, the property, the principles behind it are that um, most, the majority of our insect predators cannot withstand um, temperatures, you know, that are in, in excess of a, you know, of a, partic of a, of a particular temperature. It, it's, it's different depending upon the insect. Um, like for example, um, very carpet beetles can be killed off at a slightly lower temperature and slightly less long duration than moth, than a moth infestation. So I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, quote exact numbers, you know, and mislead anybody, but just to say that, for example, you know, a large wooden object that has some sort of penetrating beetles, as long as you can purchase flat black um, polyethylene sheeting, you know, that's um, available or black trash bags even, 
large black trash bags that you can cut up to turn into a sheeting, a flat sheeting. And you have tape that will hold up, that you already know will hold up in a hot, really hot environment and not release, you know, from the, from your bag. Mm. If you can fully enclose the item in that black plastic using that tape and place it into a area that is a high temperature exceeds a certain, you know, that whatever that given temperature is for the right duration, you can actually get, achieve a penetrating kill mm -hmm. um, deep into your wooden object. Now, you know, will you be also drying out your object? Yes, you will. But I, I actually am a great believer in dealing with your biggest risk most, you know, immediately, you know, and to me, those insects, I would prioritize that active infestation over the exposure to a, a reduced humidity, you know, because when you put something in the hot sun in a black bag, the black bag is designed to be totally absorbent. It's absorbing all of the heat. It's not reflecting any heat, black totally absorbs. So it's gonna do that. And yes, it's going to dry out the object. It's going to do that, you know? So, um, but I think that it's really crucial to deal with that, your most immediate need first. And I suppose that even in a humid environment, if you have, you know, let's say you have 80% relative humidity in some place like Pontianak um, on a given day and you place your object in a bag, that object's going to have very high humidity to begin with and it seals exactly. the bag. So perhaps that's even a better treatment in the tropics than many other treatments. I think that's right. No, I think you're right, Crystal. Yeah. No, I think that's such a clever approach. And do you think that, um, I know people are going to be asking if, you know, if their treatment Perhaps, I mean, of course, high, high temperatures last day and night in the tropics. So I suppose that even if you didn't reach an ideal temperature during one eight hour period, if you left it in that bag for a 24 hour period, you would have greater success. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's, it's actually designed so that you, you can have sustained, you know, even if, it, even if there's fl temperature fluctuation, if you if you're able to achieve that that high temperature um, for you know just a certain number of hours, even if it's intermittent, that you will achieve you know a full kill. Yeah. And just on that topic, and not to harp on this too much, but I, there's so many questions about it. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if um, there's any particular triage solutions that you might have for collections that might be painted or might have a surface treatment that might be vulnerable to high heat environments for a long period of time. If you would suggest something in terms of if it's a simple wooden object that that would be very easy to treat with a heat treatment in the sun in a plastic bag, but perhaps there's other objects that you might suggest separating out and reconsidering depending on the trickiness of of the situation, depending on how they're made or how many layers of materials are involved. I mean, it, I think it does, you know, so many items are made from multiple materials joined together. And I know that that's, that can be a real challenge. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I think that, um, I, I think that if it's, I, I think that if it's an object that is sustaining a pretty elevated temperature, um, with and you're not seeing any kind of softening of the paint or any kind of deleterious effect, um, that that would actually kind of inspire confidence in using the solar bagging. Um, where I would perhaps have a bit of concern is, you know, I know that, for example, extremes, you know, we, we, we know of some materials that don't do particularly well with freezing, 
with low temperature treatments. Like there are many instances where a paint film that is particularly brittle might actually start to flake off in a freezer treatment. And we know that there are glue lines between sections that can fail in a freezer freezing treatment. There is less research and less understanding to, the, to which materials don't respond particularly well to a high temperature treatment. And um, I think it is possible that as I said, there are certain paints that could become sticky mm -hmm. in a high temperature treatment. And there are certain adhesives that could fail in a high temperature treatment. And I think that, um, that you know, in the individuals who are the caretakers are probably going to have to kind of make a, um, try to make, you know, their, their own best assessment because I I know that your that the the high the highest temperature and I have this in degrees Fahrenheit. I apologize for that. Somebody maybe can can switch this over really rapidly. Um, but you know like 140 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature that is usually the highest that is used for these, um, for these treatments. And let me quickly do a, on my computer, I'm gonna do a quick conversion here. Yeah, so, I was just doing it. And I think that's um, 140 Fahrenheit is 60 degrees centigrade. Okay, thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, I appreciate that, yeah. I had to do the conversion too. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, it's like, well, um, but you know, so, um, so I guess the, the question would be, is, um, you know, is there, I mean, there's no, there's a kind of a, it's a difficult thing to kind of test out, right? Because you have all of those materials now together in something that's culturally important and, you know, is a heritage item, unless you have a small, less precious example that's been made using the same materials that you can do a trial run, that would be frankly my recommendation um, so that you could kind of evaluate, you know, and, and then that's of course the other thing is like if, if, if in fact um, people who are on this meeting have access to a thermometer, just, you know, even a simple thermometer and if they can keep it taped to the bag, um, and if somebody can, you know, periodically just check to see where it's maintaining, because that would also inspire confidence. If you did a test run and you could inspire confidence of, you know, you find the appropriate duration based on the insect you're, you know, you're working with and you know, it's going to be, you're, you're expecting roughly 60 degrees Celsius. Are you reaching it in that spot? Is that the right spot? Um, is there anything happening that's damaging to the collection that you don't want to have happen to your smaller item that you can potentially sacrifice that's using the same paint system, let's say, or the same adhesive system, um, or is a textile produced the same way? Um, and then, you know, then you would want to extrapolate from that. And then if you went to do it for the larger item, you would also want to be able to have some assurance you were reaching temperature across time. Absolutely. I think that these are, I mean, these are such great points. And quite frankly, I mean, it's gonna be difficult anyway, from situation to situation. Yeah. So if people do have a way of, as you said, just to restate and clarify, identify the pest first, and then you know how the duration of the treatment, which is really just such a great idea. And then from there, um, establishing if your piece, identifying if there's painted surfaces or waxes or something like that. Uh -huh. And if you have something else in your collection that's comparative in your environment. 
I mean, these are great ideas. This is very applicable. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, goodness, thank you for bringing up waxes. Obviously, this is not, if you have a sculpture that's made from wax, this is not an appropriate treatment. I mean, so many natural plant and animal waxes will melt at 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah. And we're talking about 60. <laughs> So we really have to keep that in mind. You do not want a puddle when you finish this treatment. You do not, you know. Yeah, so, that would be problem solved, right? <laughs> it would be problem solved, but it would also be problem created. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, that's, that's also, yeah, I mean, I, I really, you know, I'm always a really big fan of taking a quick image of your item before you do any of these treatments, whether it's the heat treatment, whether it's the freezing treatment, and then, you know, paying very close attention to what is happening during this treatment. And because this particular treatment, the solar bagging is in a way, I, I hate to say it, but it's, it, there's, we should have more research about this treatment and we don't. And actually I, I would really hope that people on this call would take this up as an opportunity to contribute to everybody else's knowledge about this. Like it'd be really wonderful if just as we're sharing this conversation, we could be sharing a conversation about what are the effects that people are seeing, you know, from solar bagging. That's I think really it's, important. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you. I think it's such a great opportunity. And there's so many people on this call who are in hot and humid environments, you know, so this is the, the perfect opportunity to do exactly what you're describing, which is relatively, you know, straightforward on one level. It's just reaching these criteria. And um, it actually brings up another point. Someone asked about mold infestations on mm -hmm. their collections in Sumba. Um, and I know that with certain treatments that we use for pest eradication, they also apply sometimes to mildew, to plant life. Um, is this sort of treatment with a heat um, something that has been studied at all for, in terms of solar bagging, has that been studied at all for mildew or, or mold eradication, or is this still sort of an open field? Unfortunately, Crystal, it I don't think it's actually effective on mold. Mold mm. are mold are substantially simpler um, uh, beings than are insects, mm. and um, they're they're infinitely more difficult to kill. Which is I just it's like such bad news. Frankly, if you put mold infested material in a freezer, it will not kill it low temperature does not kill mold and high temperature does not kill mold. It might make it dormant if you can sustain that lower high temperature, but as soon as you put it back in an elevated relative humidity, mm. it, will, it will come back into full, you mm. know, full flourish. Yeah, it'll just go, go forth. So that's, that's so, a really difficult, yeah, it's difficult. A, so in that such a sort of situation, then you're really looking at a different kind of treatment, whether it's, I mean, I, I know that anoxia has been explored for some of this oxygen deprivation, aspiration using vacuum cleaning, sometimes um, alcohol. Vacuum cleaning, yeah, vacuum cleaning and where it's safe. Um, isopropanol, alcohol, you know, just like pharmacy rubbing alcohol works as well. Um, but, in, but it all, of course needs to be tested because you could be working on a painted surface where the paint is actually going to come off if you try applying any alcohol yeah. or a colorant may move if you try using any alcohol. So we tend to think of vacuuming with a triple filtered vacuum or HEPA vacuum as a very safe um, way to go. But then it's, it also involves keeping the relative humidity below 70% and keeping the air very, keeping a lot of ventilation. 
So you have to have a lot to, to um, discourage regrowth of mold after you have vacuumed, you need to keep the relative humidity below 70% and you have to keep the air moving. And, and so, um, you know, we know that ceiling fans, if even if you have a, a high, higher humidity, ceiling fans can be the crucial difference. That's, I think, a really excellent point because, I mean, probably once you have in a high humidity environment, if you have 70% relative humidity on a good day in many of these places, then keeping the air moving, keeping good circulation and ventilation is going to be part of your solution, Absolutely. even if you struggle with the humidity. Yeah. And that's actually a good, I mean, that's a great segue to another slew of questions that have come up yeah. and that has to do with correct humidity and temperature, correct relative humidity, I should say, and temperature in humid environments, um, not just for organic materials. I'm, there are specific questions about the correct yeah. relative humidity for baskets, but, as, but also ceramics. Um, so just a whole wide range of materials. I'm so, wondering, you know, David. Absolutely. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, especially in a high humidity climate location, I would try to keep organics um, no higher than 65% RH if, if that is possible to achieve. And um, that, that can be possible to achieve with, as I mentioned earlier, silica gel, you know, by using silica gel in closed containers, if, if you are in a higher humidity region. Um, <clears throat> and then for ceramics, humidity is not as much an issue for ceramics unless they have been, um, buried or are exposed to a, an extreme marine environment. If they have been penetrated with marine born soluble salts, then we have to be concerned about um, having extreme relative humidity fluctuations for ceramics. If they have not been exposed to um, you know, uh, marine born soluble salts, they can typically um, withstand a, a broader range of ceramics. And I'd be very interested whether anybody who's working with um, historical or contemporary ceramics and are in a humid climate, whether they're seeing any problems specifically with any of those ceramics, because that's, I would be surprised, but that would be, of course, extremely interesting. I think that, yeah, I I'm, I'm, would be very interested to know as well. And actually, this is a great opportunity for me to um, mention that Seifel is, in, in addition to his many other skill sets, is a specialist in ceramics conservation. And he has been translating here like a hero and I would just like to increase his workload by asking him to say some things in English as well as Indonesian. Saifel, would you like to join in? Um, thank you so much for everything you're doing over there. Um, he's a, I, I would like to add that um, Saifel has been, he, he was very instrumental in the conservation of a, of a set of ceramics that were destroyed in um, a very monumental, earthquake and tsunami that um, in Indonesia recently and was able to really consolidate the collection with the help of the staff and they did a massive intervention. So I just wanted to, to put that shout out. Oh. But I wanted to say, Saifel, I know that we're running out low on time that Sandra has sent me a little message alerting me to the fact that we could talk all night and I would love to pick <laughs> your brain, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so many more questions about everything from tech, wet cleaning textiles. And I mean, the, the, the discussion could go on, 
but I'm wondering, Seifel, if you'd like to contribute some words, maybe even um, switching gears to English as well as Indonesian. I don't know how. <laughs> that would be hard. <laughs> okay. but, um, anyway, um, thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much for the very interesting points and very relevant to Indonesian condition. And I've seen that there are other participants actually coming from other parts of the world that has this similar like situation like Indonesia because uh, of the hot and humid climate and it's all, all other problems that comes with it, especially uh, with collections. And um, I've got a question actually for you, Ellen, to address yeah. a, a simple question. Because uh, in Indonesia, there are many, there are several institutions with uh, outdoor uh, collections. Mm. How would you approach that? I mean, whether, you know, uh, applying sacrificial layer or, I don't know, other methods to prevent damages uh, that you can do or based on your experience on working on different uh, institutions that might be applicable to uh, some uh, several institutions here. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, thank you, um, Seifel, for that great question. Um, and, and it is true, I was, I was very much addressing collections held in an indoor environment. So um, I, you know, I would say that, yes, there are um, sacrificial uh, coatings that can be put on outdoor items. And um, the key with sacrificial coatings that are put on outdoor um, materials is the need to maintain them because um, they are truly, as we say, sacrificial. They're designed to um, be used up um, at the expense of the, you know, so in other words, they're being used up first so that we can privilege the original surfaces on the materials held outdoors. And so if we let that coating, if we, if we think we've put that coating on and then we are, um, we think it's going to be protective in perpetuity, then we end up almost fooling ourselves into thinking we've done something preservative. And in fact, we haven't. And of course the environment will wear that coating down. And so we have, to, it, it's like a commitment to saying every year or every six months, I will renew that coding. And so it's, it's work, I know that. I know it's work for people, but it is, yeah. But it, but it, can, it can definitely help. It absolutely can help. And there's a whole range, again, I, there's insufficient time for even speaking about it further, but um, there are coatings that are um, available that are a, primarily a wax wax based coatings, and there are coatings that are available that are actually applied in a water solution, um, and that's usually used more on stone and ceramic outdoor sculptural materials, at, whereas wax paraffin in particular are usually used on outdoor wood and metal materials. So um, those can be very protective if they're maintained. Yeah. Great, thank you. Sure. Uh, I guess there are so many questions here then we don't have time. I think, I think, um, we would like to answer the questions, but we will compile it in a single document and then I'll discuss it with Ellen and yeah. Crystal. I, I was just going to say, you know, Saiful, if, if somebody wants to save the chat or the Q&A and you want uh, to send it to me and the emails, you know, all of the emails, yeah. I'd be happy to look at those questions. And I'm also, I'm hoping that it's the case that in the format in which 
this my presentation is shared, people will have access to those links. Is that true? So I see Megan nodding. So that's okay. Good, good. Yeah. Because I I really think that you know those those links are fantastic. I mean, I really handpicked each one of them. And if people have internet access, which I realize not everybody does, but if people do, we I'm assuming the people who participated in this meeting most certainly do. So um, those are really good resources um, if people are fluent in English and can, you know, can access them. Again, I'm not certain about the full translation of any of those resources, but maybe the solar bagging would be one that would be very valuable for translation, you know, into Indonesian. I mean, I that seems to me to be a really great, um, a great idea just just at the outset, and I can work with Seifel, you know, and all of that, if that's something that that you'd like to... You I'm know, more than happy to provide the translation for yeah. the solar thing, because yeah. it seems no, like I, very simple, but... Yeah, crucial, crucial, I would say, yeah, so anyway, do please save the chat questions, you know, and however you would like to work this, I'd be happy to take a look and, and respond, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. This yeah. has just been fabulous. Thank you. And, and thank you all for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity, really. Yes, thank you all again for joining us. Ellen will be, I know APHIS will be happy to make resources available. And if I can speak for tracing patterns, I'm sure that they will also be able to compile resources and continue some of these questions in an F FAQ later on, because I know there's so many details that this audience would like to, to dive into further with you. But thank you again, Ellen, for your time and sharing all of this just wonderful, rich information with us. Um, with that, um, I will conclude this second session of the Museums of uh, for the 21st Century webinar. Uh, once again, I want to thank Alan Perlson, our moderators, Kristen Hale and Saiful Bakri, also Saiful for doing the live translations for us. And of course, members of the US Embassy in Jakarta for helping to make the M21 Museum project possible. If you enjoyed this event, Please join us for the next and final session of the M Museums for the 21st Century webinar. This will be taking place on February 20th at 10 a.m. in Western Indonesia time. This final session will be focused on curation and address non-Western museum paradigms. We'll be joined at that time by Dr. Christina Kreps from uh, Denver University in Colorado and Dr. Anna Labrador from the University of Michigan. Finally, I want to thank our audience joining in the Zoom meeting on YouTube, as well as um, those watching the recorded event later on. We're thrilled to share this discussion with you, Ellen, and we really appreciate all of your participation in the Museums for the 21st Century webinar series. On behalf of Tracing Patterns Foundation, the Smithsonian Institution, for Asian Cultural History Program, Institut Conservasi, Museum Turia, and the American Institute for Indonesian Studies. Thank you all for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again on February 20th. Everyone have a good day, a nice evening. Enjoy the rest of your weeks. <laughs>